Welcome to the Packet Analysis Workshop. We're going to get started by taking a look at network packets and protocols. We'll work through some common protocols such as TCP, UDP, IP, and some helper protocols. Later on, we're going to take a look at specific tools, Wireshark and Network Miner, along with TCP Dump. With TCP Dump, we can capture packets and then do the analysis with Network Miner and Wireshark. In a lot of the cases, we'll be able to solve the problems with either of the tool, but using different techniques, and we'll try to cover both. Then later, we're going to work on a lab. We have 25 questions to answer, and the answers are available, but try not to look at those until the end. And we'll walk through answering each of the questions later on in the course. To start with, we're going to use the OSI model to represent our network. It's based on the idea of layers, but sometimes it's better to think of these as Lego blocks. Each layer is responsible for doing a job, a very specific job, and typically this layer is very good at doing that exact job. But it's not very good at doing any of the other layer's jobs. The exception, as we'll see, will be the application layer. Communications is split into discrete packets. This is a fixed amount of information that travels across the network. So if you have a message that's too large to fit in a particular packet, we'll need to break that message up, send it across the network in different packets, and then put those packets back together at the other side. We'll see later that depending on whether you use TCP or UDP greatly affects how and when these packets are reassembled. The important thing to remember so far is that each layer is responsible for moving the packet a part of the way across the total journey. A protocol is just an agreement on how we're going to represent information. For example, IP or the Internet Protocol has a very specific structure and the fields are laid out in an exact order and each field has an exact length and an exact representation. Some fields are integers, some fields are bits, but each field has an exact way that we're to interpret it, no matter what kind of piece of equipment we're using, no matter who manufactured it, or other variables. Now sometimes there are protocols that are complicated, and they will actually combine together different layers into the single protocol. So for example, HTTP is capable of representing the application layer, but it can also represent the presentation layer and the session layer. So layer 7 is the application layer, and that's the layer that the HTTP messages are carried back and forth. Usually the HTTP protocol carries things like HTML, web pages in other words, JavaScript, style sheets, SOAP, JSON, and REST messages. But when you think about an HTTP-based application, you also see that HTTP can handle the presentation layer. For example, it can encode the data with gzip so that the data is compressed before it's sent across the internet. Also, HTTP packets can travel on top of TLS, used to be known as SSL, if we're transmitting via HTTPS or HTTP over SSL. Now SSL itself has been replaced by TLS in recent years, but the name stuck. Presentation is how the data is formatted. GZIP is compression, that's a format. Encryption itself, like using TLS or HTTPS, is also a format. Those are all layer 6. And anyone who uses a website for any time realizes that websites have sessions stored in cookies. There can be other information stored in cookies as well, but certainly our login information, our session token, is one of the most common across lots of different websites. So a protocol is an agreement on how we're going to send a particular packet. The OSI model has these seven traditional layers. The lowest layer, the physical layer, is how we transmit the signal in real life. It's the only layer that actually exists in the physical world. 
starting at the data link layer and moving up all the way through the stack to the application layer, those are all logical or conceptual layers. They're ways of organizing information in agreement on how each side is going to handle the communications, but they don't actually exist in real life. The physical layer, on the other hand, is how we actually transmit the information. So for example, we might transmit it over radio waves in a Wi-Fi network or using electrons flowing through a cable if we're using an Ethernet cable jacks and plugs. Also, there can be more advanced communications, fiber optic cables, for example. A lot of times in municipalities, you'll see packets carried underground or over the wires in the city with fiber optics, even with telephone cable perhaps. But when it gets to the house, it'll be converted into the more traditional ethernet. And a lot of us have used Wi-Fi networks, and of course those are radio waves. The OSI model sometimes struggles to represent modern protocols because of protocols like HTTP that encapsulate more than one layer in the OSI model. So it may be easier to think about the layers as application transport, that would be TCP or UDP in most cases, the network layer, like the internet protocol, and the link layer, such as Ethernet. Because if you think about a lot of traffic, it has a tendency to be Ethernet carrying internet protocol, which is carrying TCP, which is carrying the application layer. A lot of times this is web, FTP, or email. So especially if you're developing software, this model may be a easier representation to map to what is going on conceptually inside of the software. When the data is traveling over the media, for example down the wire, the information, the bits, they're actually traveling in a row in one long stream or a line, one behind the other. When we look at diagrams later, we're going to look at the diagrams more like tables. We're going to have 32 bits of information in each row, and then we'll have a row for each line in the table representing more information down the protocol. But in, when the data is actually transmitted, it's not transmitted as a table or in 32-bit chunks or anything like that. It's actually transmitted all at once in a long line. Now each packet is transmitted individually, but that entire packet is sent all at once. So later on when we look at the tables that represent these protocols and their structure, don't get confused that the packet is broken up when it's sent. It's actually sent all at once. Now, Internet Protocol does allow more than one Internet Protocol packet to be sent, but that's a feature of that particular protocol. Still, any given packet is transmitted all at once in a burst. Also note that the direction of travel is from the link layer through the application layer. So the link layer information is sent and then followed immediately by the internet protocol, TCP protocol, or UDP protocol, session, presentation, and application layers. They're all sent back to back. There is no separation between them. Immediately after the last bit of the previous protocol, the next protocol starts. The first layer is the physical layer, the only layer that we can actually represent in real life. So this again is going to be things like RJ45 or cables. This RJ45 specifies the construction of these cables. For example, they have eight wires made up of four twisted pairs that terminate at pins or at the end of the cable in a specific order. And there's also radio wave transmission, better known as Wi-Fi. And of course, you can also transmit over other kinds of radio waves. For example, cellular is very popular. And these are not the only media. There's fiber optics, satellite communications, all kinds of other media. But generally speaking for today, 
we're just going to talk about RJ45 or traditional network cable, Cat5 or Cat6, and then we'll also talk a little bit about Wi-Fi, but we'll just kind of assume that those are the two most common that we run into in everyday life, in our houses, and our businesses, and that that'll cover the majority of the audience. The first layer we're going to talk about today is the logical link layer. Often this is going to be Ethernet. Ethernet is by far the most popular in regular homes and businesses. There are special situations where other layer 2 protocols can be used though. It's just that we tend to run into Ethernet in a typical scenario. The Ethernet layer is responsible for allowing computers that are on the same network subnet to talk to one another. In other words, there's no concept of routers or routing at this layer. You can have two computers that are in the same room, or they can be separated by a little bit of distance. But in general, all these computers are going to be connected together through the same switch. It used to be that we would connect these together with hubs, but hubs haven't been around for a while because they had problems where they would both leak information and also they cause a lot of collisions. With the hubs, you would plug all the computers into the same hub and when one computer would talk, that message would get broadcast to all the other computers connected to the hub. Obviously this is very wasteful, but it also increased the amount of network traffic quite a bit. So it made it a lot more likely that two computers would happen to send a message at the same time and cause a collision. Later on, when security became more important, it was also recognized that when one computer spoke, all the other computers heard what the, compu what the first computer said. So this isn't secure. And switches gained popularity for both reasons. Switches listen on each individual plug or port for a computer to send a message. When the message is sent, the switch takes that message and inspects it looking at the layer 2 packet to see who the destination is and that's based on the MAC address. The MAC address is the address of the network interface or typically the network card. When the cards are manufactured they're given this unique serial number. The left hand side or the first three octets represent the manufacturer who created the card. This is called the Organizational Unique Identifier. And this is going to be common on any of the cards that were manufactured under that name. On the right hand side, the next three bits represents the unique ID for that particular card. It's supposed to be unique. Every once in a while you'll see a card that accidentally has the same number, but this is rare. Typically that only occurs if someone has cloned the card or if one manufacturer is trying to steal another manufacturer's IDs. So switches and hosts use MAC addresses to refer to one another at layer 2. And MAC addresses are only good at layer 2. They can't be used at the other layers because they don't have any meaning outside of layer 2. So for example, if one computer is sitting in network A and it wants to talk to another computer in network B, but network B is halfway around the world, over layer 2, those two computers are not going to be able to speak with one another because they're not on the same subnet. So what will end up happening in those situations is layer 2 will at least get the message from computer A to the switch and the router. The router will have to help the message get all the way across the internet by routing the, the information over, over several routers to reach the destination router. When the packet makes it all the way to the final network where the computer B resides, the one that's going to get the message, then the MAC address of computer B will be determined at that point. So computer A doesn't know the MAC address of, the, of that long distance computer because it's not on the same subnet and it can't ask what the MAC address is. All they would know would be the IP. So here's an example of a layer 2 packet. This is a good idea 
to time to open up Wireshark and look at the packets. Open up any of the PCAPs. They're all Ethernet. So any packet will work. Click on any packet and then you can click on the Ethernet line in Wireshark. If you notice, the Ethernet bits are the very first bits in the packet. This is the very first of the logical layers. And looking back at the protocol, the first 24 bits are going to be the OUI, and the second 24 are going to be this unique number of this particular network interface or network card, if you want to think of it that way. So the first three packets, 000C29, those refer to the vendor that manufactured this particular first network card. In this case, it's going to be the leftmost 24 bits. And then it's followed up by B08D62. And you can actually see that up in this Wireshark mock up here. So B08D62, that's the unique number for the VMware card, the destination address. After the first six hex digits starts another network card, and this one starts with 002170, and that represents Dell. And the unique number on that card is 4D4FAE. Now it takes all six of those hex digits to represent the entire MAC address. It's just that the MAC address just happens to be broken up into two halves, the manufacturer of the card and the ID of the card itself. But the whole thing is used by the switch to figure out which card to send the information to. Now, when we're talking about Ethernet specifically, we really say that the information is going to the network interface or the network card, not technically the computer, because a given computer can have more than one network interface in it, and each one of them is going to have to have a MAC address. Over on the right-hand side, is just the raw information that's in the packet. We can see that this particular packet happens to be ultimately carrying HTTP. And it does so from Ethernet, carrying internet protocol or IP, which is carrying a TCP packet, which is carrying an HTTP packet. And all of those are represented simultaneously on the screen here. Now notice at the very end of the Ethernet information, the IP information, the next protocol, begins immediately. There's no marker or space. The only way that we actually know that this is the end of Ethernet and beginning of IP is because we looked at the protocol and the protocol very specifically told us exactly how to interpret this information. And that's the importance of protocols, is both sides of the communication have to agree on exactly how to interpret this information because if you looked at it literally it would just be ones and zeros being transmitted across the media. Another thing about these numbers before we go on is these numbers are hex digits and hex decimal is a little bit different than base 10 that we're used to. Normally when we count to 10 we would say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, but then we run out of digits, and we have to start over to get to 10. So in order to get to 10, we zero out the 1's position, and then we put a 1 in the 10's position. So the number 10 interpreted very literally is we have 1, 10, and 0, 1's. In other words, 1, 0, or 10. Seems obvious to us because we use it every day, but when you start to try to read hex numbers, you realize you kind of have to think through exactly how digits work. Let's look at the hex digit 21 here. It looks like our number 21, but it's not. It's actually 1, 1, and then 2 16s. Because in hexadecimal, there's 15 digits. It's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 but then it goes A, B, C, D, E, F. There's six extra digits 
unlike base 10. That's why it's called base 16. It's based on 16 digits. So if you want to count in hexadecimal to 21, you would say 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then you would say 10, because you would zero out the ones, and then you would have 1, 16, or, but it would look like R number 10, even though it represents 16 in base 10. So 21 hex is not 21 in R numbers. It's two 16s and one one. Two 16s is 32, plus one is 33. This number here in base 10 is actually 33. It's not 21. So when reading these digits in Wireshark, be careful because they are base 16 or hexadecimal, and that's why they have letters in them sometimes. Now the letters will only be A through F again because once you run out at F, you start over at zero and add one to the next column over to the left. The next protocol we're going to look at is internet protocol. And again, we're going to represent these protocols in tabular form, makes them easier to read, and also it helps us divide up how long all these packet fields are. But again, the data will be transmitted just in one long stream. So the first field is the version. And for IPv4, this will be 4. For IPv6, this will be 6. So this field is pretty easy. And it can kind of help us figure out where the end of the MAC address is, since we know what the number is going to be in advance. The IHL is the internet header length. It's how long is the IP packet, not counting the data. And it's also interesting to note down here in this data area that from Internet Protocol's point of view, data in this example is going to be TCP. The IP protocol doesn't really know that there's a such thing as a TCP. It just knows that it's carrying data. How that data is organized is determined by another protocol. So in our example, TCP determines how this purple data area down here is organized. The next field is the type of service and then followed by the total length. So the total length would be the length of the data plus the length of the IHL. It's the total length from IP's point of view. It doesn't count the Ethernet because IP doesn't have a concept of the Ethernet frame. So those bytes aren't counted in the total length because this is total length only as Internet Protocol sees it. The Internet Protocol recognizes itself, plus it recognizes it's carrying all this data. So this is a good point to look at how long these, these fields are. So the total length of this entire row from right to left is 32 bits. So the version field we can see over here on the left would be 4, 4 bits. Halfway is 16 bits, half of 32. Half again is 8 bits, and then half again is 4 bits. So the version field and the IHL or Internet Header Length field are only 4 bits each. And the type of service is 8 bits, and the total length is 16 bits. Identification field is 16 bits. Then we have the flags. There's only three of those flags, and then we have the fragment offset. So the flags is a little bit funny because there's only three of them. Let's take a look at what some of the other fields do. The identification is the name of this particular packet. Now it's actually going to be a number, but think of it as the name or the identifier of this particular packet. The flags tell us if whether or not we're fragmenting the packet, and they also tell us whether or not if in the case that we are fragmenting, if this is the last packet or not. The fragment offset is just going to be the number of the packet. So let's say, for example, that this IP packet were fragmented into three parts. The, the identification would be the same in all three packets. It's just the identifier that names this particular group of packets. If it was fragmented, 
then the don't fragment bit would be zero. And for the first packet, it would not be marked as the last packet, of course, because it's the first. And the fragment offset would just be marked as the first packet. Then the second packet would have the exact same ID. It would not be marked as the last packet. And it would have a fragment offset indicating it's the second packet. And then finally, the third packet would have the exact same ID. It would be marked as the last packet in the flags. And the fragment offset would indicate it's the third packet. So when the router at the other end of the stream gets this packet, it could put it all back together because it knows the order of the packets. It knows which one is the last one so that it can stop waiting for fragments. And it knows which packets should actually be grouped together because they would all have the same name or identification. The time to live is how many hops this packet is going to run around networks before finally some router gives up and drops the packet. The time to live on Linux systems is typically going to be about 64 but on Windows, it should be right about 128. Other systems use other numbers. For example, Solaris might use 255. So, in other words, a Linux packet with an initial time to live of 64 can make 64 hops, or in other words, be transmitted to 64 routers in a row before the time to live is finally going to expire and that last router would just drop the packet. Every time the IP packet passes through a router, that router is going to decrement the time to live by one. The protocol here is not the IP protocol in use. That's the version field. This protocol here is what's being carried. So in our example, we're carrying the TCP protocol. So TCP would be entered as the protocol here. There's a header checksum. And then, then finally, the source and destination addresses. Notice these are 32 bits. They're the longest two fields in the IP packet. Usually, there's not options, but there is a space for the options to be present. And then after the options, there's going to be some padding to make sure that we end on a 32-bit boundary. This is where the IHL comes in. The IHL is not represented in bytes or bits. It's actually represented in words. A word is 32 bits or 4 bytes. So this top row with version through total length is one word in length. And in this packet, assuming there's no options, there would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 words represented by the 5 first rows in this table. So if we were to see this particular IP packet with no options, the first two numbers would be version 4, internet header length 5, or 45. If we take a look at the representation of an IP packet, we can see that that 45 will often start right here. And it helps us mark the beginning of the IP packet. And then the remaining fields go from there. But remember, the version field was only 4 bits, so it's represented by one hex digit. The IHL was also 4 bits, and it's represented by one hex digit. And Wireshark, because Wireshark always shows the hex digits in pairs, in other words, it shows one byte at a time, those two numbers are right next to one another with no space between them. Each of these two pairs of hex digits is one byte. The biggest number you can have would be FF, which is 255, which is the biggest value of a byte. A byte being 8 bits. The biggest byte you can have would be 8 ones in a row, which is 255. It's just two different representations. So in fact, we have three representations that we're probably switching back and forth on. The biggest that a byte can be as an integer is 255. The biggest that a byte can be in hexadecimal two digits is FF. And the biggest that a byte can be in binary is eight ones in a row. We 
can look at some of the other fields as well. Particularly important ones include the source and destination addresses. These are the IP addresses or internet protocol addresses. So notice that the packets each have two addresses. There's the MAC address that's going to be used on the local subnet when the packet is being transmitted locally without any kind of routing. As soon as the packet needs to leave our current network and go on to some destination network, it's going to start using the IP address. But all of these packets are going to have both addresses. The address of the network card itself within the subnet and the IP address of the packet indicating which host it belongs to. And you can see that this internet protocol packet is carrying a TCP packet. So if we look at some of these fields, there was version, IHL, and the type of service, the total length of the packet, the identification, the flags, and the fragment offset, the time to live, protocol, checksum, source, and destination address. What you'll see is that Wireshark will represent these in lines. So in Wireshark, click the triangle symbol on the left to open an internet protocol packet up and you can look at all these different fields interpreted for you. Also, if you click on one of the fields, it'll turn that area down here in the hex decimal stream blue and it'll also turn the raw data on the right hand side blue. The raw data is not real useful for the first couple of protocols, but later on when we see ASCII protocols like HTTP, you can actually start to read the HTTP on the right over in the raw stream. TCP is another protocol that we're going to look at today along with UDP. These are the layer 4 packets or the transport layer packets. When you're talking about TCP and UDP, things really start to get very conceptual. When we look at MAC addresses, we know those are the address of the network interface, typically a network card. When we talk about IP address, that's the address of the host. And when we talk about TCP though, we're talking about ports, which gets to be a little bit more of an ethereal concept. A port is a number assigned to a program. Programs run on operating systems, and most of the time the program just runs locally on that particular operating system doesn't talk to the rest of the world. But there are special processes that are allowed to use the network interface to communicate outside of that host. When one of these special processes starts, it has to ask the operating system permission to talk on the network interface. Well, the operating system will grant this access if the process is set up correctly, but the operating system is going to have a big problem. There's going to be a bunch of processes that are all using that exact same network interface. These messages are coming in quickly and the operating system has to know which process or which program running program is supposed to get that message. So what the operating system does is when the when the program is instantiated and is run as a process in the operating system, the operating system will assign to it a number. This is the port number that represents that process when a layer 4 packet arrives. So for example, by default, FTP programs, FTP servers, will have a tendency to get port 21 assigned to them, or number 21, as their listening port. When a message comes in, if the destination port in the TCP packet, in our example, happens to be 21, the operating system is going to know that that message is intended for that FTP program. It's not going to give it to the web server or to some other program that's running. It realizes that by the port number, that's the assignment. So transport layer packets will have the source port, the program that sent the message, and the destination port, the program that's going to receive the message. And so what these ports do is they map the message itself to the program that's supposed to get the message. The source port and the destination port in TCP protocol are the first two fields. 
and they're both 16 bits long. That means that port numbers can be between 0 and 65535. So port numbers are pretty broad. Port numbers that are between 0 and 1023 or 1023 are typically reserved for services running on the operating system that are common and that also have privileges above user. Whenever a user program is running and it's reaching out, typically it's going to pick a port number that's higher than 1023. It's going to pick a number often that's probably five digits long even. Could be anything. It might be something like 35123. But generally speaking, if the port number is relatively no low, that is typically given to a listening service or a program listening for messages to come in. And if the port number is relatively high, then typically it's a client program that's sending a message to a service or to a server. So TCP also has sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers because TCP, as we'll see later, actually cares about the order of the packets and whether or not they arrive. So the sequence numbers help TCP keep the packets in the right order. If two packets are sent, they go across the network or the internet and they get to the destination, but they got flip-flopped. In other words, the second packet arrived first. The receiving computer can look at the sequence numbers and realize that they're out of order and put them back into order. The acknowledgement number is used by the system that's receiving the message to acknowledge that it got the packet. Because in TCP, if that acknowledgement is not received by the sender in a certain amount of time, the sender is going to resend that packet. Obviously, on noisy networks or poor bandwidth networks, there can be congestion and packets may not arrive or they may arrive too slowly and not be acknowledged in time. And so in TCP networks, you can see packets retransmitted. We'll see later that UDP doesn't do this. Other fields in TCP are the header, and the flags, the window, checksum, and urgent pointer. Now the most important fields besides the ports, the sequence and the acknowledgement number is the flags. So what we'll see later is that in TCP there are flags like synchronize, acknowledgement, finish, urgent, push, and others that help determine what kind of TCP packet it is and those help manage the TCP communications so the two computers can get on the same page and talk to one another. The flags will be looked at in detail later. So looking at a TCP packet in Wireshark we can see that it starts here just after the end of the IP packet. Again there's no barrier between them the next bit after the last bit of the IP is TCP. And it starts off with the port and then the destination port. So the first port, 04F9, is the hexadecimal representation of port 1273 in decimal. In other words, 4F9 in hexadecimal is equal to 1273 in base 10. We see that the destination port is represented as 50 which is 80 in our regular base 10 numbers. So 50, 50, is 5 16s plus 0 1s. 5 times 16 can be figured out by taking 5 times 10 is 50, and 5 times 6 is 30, and 50 and 30 is 80. In other words, 50 hexadecimal is equal to 80. So the most important fields are the ports, sequence and acknowledgement numbers, and the flags.